Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I thank uh, Dr. Weinschelbaum for, for the terrific invitation. That's a tough act to follow. Uh, very, very difficult. He's always impressive, and uh, I enjoy listening to his presentations. Um, so, I am going to take the perspective of uh, drug discovery and development here, uh, even though I'm, I'm not your, probably your traditional pharma person. I've been there about six years uh, after an academic career, so I I'm, I'm still feel like I'm um, learning uh, on the job, my first job, actually. And um, what I'd like to do to stage this presentation is take almost an irreverent view of genetics. And I think it's important for those of you that are graduate students or postdocs to maybe think about uh, reflecting back a little bit. If you go back into the 1990s, when I was a student, genetics was really, really exciting. Uh, the human genome wasn't even on the horizon yet, but the um, restriction fragment length polymorphisms were coming up, and we were learning a little bit about um, molecular biology, and it all looked very um, exciting. And, of course, it got extremely overhyped uh, at that time, and suddenly personalized medicine was going to be everywhere, and we were just going to have uh, a drug for every individual, and it was all going to come out if only we could um, sequence the human genome. And, of course, that didn't come to pass. We had lots and lots of findings. Uh, the young people won't remember, but it used to be the case that about every six months or something, there would be a report in Nature of Science or Cell on the next diabetes discovery or some bipolar disorder uh, new gene. And then it would quietly go away because no one could reproduce that finding. Those days are gone, but what happened was we got a lot of hype going up. And then, of course, because it wasn't realized, the field came crashing down and it became extremely unpopular to talk about genetics. Um, it, was the, it was the easy way uh, to uh, kill a dinner party conversation, is to just say, I'm a geneticist. For me, it was even easier because I could say I was a statistical geneticist, and that really cleared the room. Um, but, the, uh, but the point is that genetics became really unpopular, and so people like Big Pharma or biotech who had invested massively in this promise of personalized medicine, they all left. And they left just about the time the field turned back around and started getting interesting. So now, you hear the previous presentation, it's super exciting to be in genetics. It's, it's back on track, it's leading to new discoveries, but it's only just recently that that's turned the corner. And what I'd like to do today is just share some thoughts on where it's turning the corner and what the challenges are uh, and the opportunities going forward, because it's not just there, it's actually just starting over again. And, and by the way, I, I thought I had discovered this trend uh, of going up and then um, dropping down. And it turns out this is, this is a very standard uh, economic trend called the hype cycle, and it, it occurs all the time uh, in things like bioelectronics and IT, where things get overhyped, bottom falls out, and then just about the time things get interest, things everyone leaves, things get interesting again. So what I'd like to do to couch this is a few different applications. Um, You've got terrific speakers here. You just heard one on pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. I, I just want to give a brief view of the drug discovery perspective of where that is. Uh, your questions would be better answered by, by those that have thought hard for years and years on that. Then I would like to go very, very briefly into drug repositioning as a potential application uh, for um, genetics and genomics today. What I really want to do is emphasize target validation, the third one there. So I'll I'll sort of try to be brief getting up to that point, because that's, uh, to us in the, in, um, in the pharmaceutical industry, this is a, a really exciting area right now. And then just leave it with electronic medical records or electronic health records. So the first piece here. Adverse drug response. From a, from a drug discovery perspective, you read about these quite often. And actually, the point I would like to make to you is for, for side effects, for major adverse drug response, the detection side, finding the genes responsible for those, is not that hard. The tools that you heard about in the previous conversation, uh, they can be lended to those type of discoveries. The genes are uh, amenable to be found, and you read about them in, in big uh, journals. And this is a rather old paper, but it illustrates the, uh, uh, um, the uh, same effect that you'd, you'd see today. The effect sizes, those are in odds ratios or risks, are large. So to put this into context, you see, you see values there for clopidogrel from three and, uh, to something, a back of ear that's almost unmeasurable, that is the, the, the hypersensitivity reactions to a back of ear. If you put that into context of um, disease genes, so the biggest genes that we would find, for example, for type 2 diabetes would be far less than two 
on that same scale, the biggest ones uh, that we would see. So, so the effects are really large for adverse drug response. And you don't need someone like me to look at Manhattan plots and tell you that where they are when you look at genome-wide association studies. These are just some that we picked out, fluclocicillin, augmentin. Um, and it is, just as you saw in the previous presentation, only you don't need any real statistics whatsoever. If there is a gene there, and you have a handful of cases that have that same mechanism, then the, um, the detection of that gene is pretty straightforward. And this is how things uh, tend to be seen in uh, genome-wide association. I thought I'd give you an example from, um, from here, because it was led by uh, Dan Shade, who did some beautiful work on one of, uh, one of the GSK compounds uh, called uh, lapatinib or Tycurb. Or you can see there, I don't, need to, don't want to go too much into the data, but you can just see on the, on the hazards there, huge separation um, between those that carry a genetic variant or, or genetic variants and, um, and those who don't in terms of their, their risk for developing, in this case, um, uh, liver injury uh, adverse events. And you can see the Manhattan plot at the bottom as well. So the, so the point there is that, and you can see it here, the effect sizes are large for adverse event. On the left side of this, this slide here, it's a bit of a clumsy slide, but it's kind of an Im important observation there. If you look at the y-axis, we've got allele frequency. So how common, how prevalent in the population is something. It's maybe not so relevant to a lot of you, but it's important for detection purposes. The, the x-axis is the more important one for this. How big are the effects? The left side there shows for known adverse drug response, you get big effects. Odds ratios of 5, 10, 50, 100, really large. And so they are detectable. Now, I'll go to the efficacy side, the right-hand side, in a moment. But it's, it's important on that to recognize they're detectable, but actually when, when you have the effects. But I suspect we're going to see fewer and fewer of those. Because if you look at it from a drug discovery perspective, if there are big effects sitting there on some big effects that are common in the population that manifest in some, in, for some compound, it's not going to make it. It should, if those are common in the population, we'll see them early, and that, that molecule will be terminated for further development. So it wouldn't necessarily make it to, uh, to the marketplace. And the example that I just gave you, and there are, there are a number of others on that, um, are with um, cancer drugs, where the, the uh, dose is higher and the risk benefit is different, and sometimes um, those adverse events are more uh, tolerable given the, the benefit profile of those. So you see sometimes more there. But my prediction is, even though these effect sizes are big, there won't be a lot of them that we see just because they're not that common in the population. They get weeded out uh, fairly early, or they should, um, when they're detected in the drug discovery process. So that's, that's adverse event. Big effects, detectable. But, um, but we'll see how, how, how many there are that, uh, that are remaining to be found. It's interesting. The other side of the, of the coin, to date, for drug response, efficacy, personalized medicine, the promise that w brought us to the top of the hype cycle, those have been less easy to identify. There aren't the same number of big, big, large tables of drug response genes that absolutely could steer you from this medicine to a different medicine. The effect sizes to date tend to be smaller on those. They tend to look like the genes that we find for common complex diseases. And those of you that aren't in the genetics domain, just I gave you a diabetes example a moment ago, but um, even not even 10 years ago, in two, uh, maybe ten, in 2005-ish, we used to have um, debates, a lot of us would have debates, on how many known robust genes there are for common diseases like diabetes or heart disease or even psychiatric disorders? How many are robust and believable? And the real optimists in the room would say 20, 30. And the pessimists like myself might say 10 maximally that we really know. That was, that was less than 10 years ago. And now, even from genome-wide association studies, we, not, we may not know how the genes work, but robust findings number in the 2000s two orders of magnitude of new discoveries in the last decade. And, th and those are robust findings. They're real. Now, we need to understand what they do, but they're real. And if you go out and you collect enough samples, you'll reproduce those findings. And what they tend to look like is relatively common in the population and individually 
have a small effect on the disease. So you put them all together and they maybe influence, um, increase the predictability. That's sort of what the efficacy or the drug response findings look like. Small effect, rather common, and not that actionable um, in general for prediction. Now there are lots of reasons for this, um, or there are lots of hypotheses on why this is the case. M my own view is I, I don't know yet that that's how the, the nature, how nature is going to really play the cards there. I think we haven't um, studied them in the right samples, so I think it's an open question. But when you, when you look at these, you see this is one from a, um, a VEGF uh, inhibitor for renal cell carcinoma. Just to show you, not to describe the finding very much, but just to show you that um, the Manhattan plots look more like those that you would see for type 2 diabetes or hypertension or major depression or whichever, where you, you may have a hint of something that comes up. So it's an interesting paradigm there because we've got all these drugs on the market the personalized medicine promise was that um, all we needed was tools or the genome or sequencing or genotyping and we would find these things and we haven't. We, we have for adverse events and we will continue to when they are common in, in, uh, in the population, but not yet for efficacy. Uh, and I think, it's anybody's, uh, I think it's anybody's game, anybody's question on whether that will change or whether that's just not the way you find um, genes that segregate populations into responders or non-responders? Do you find them after you've developed the drug, in other words, or do you look earlier in the pipeline, uh, in the drug discovery uh, approach? So that's, that's what I wanted to say about pharmacogenetics. Again, just to, just to rehash there, the safety side, big effects, detectable, how many are there? Efficacy side, so far smaller effects, harder to detect, and so far largely not as predictive um, as as we see for safety. So that was one piece, and it meant to just to be as background from the drug discoverer perspective. And again, there, there are those here, um, Munir Pir Mohammed's here, Dr. Weinshelbaum. You can hear some terrific work on how we're really unraveling um, in a much deeper sense, pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. And maybe we can hear also why um, for adverse drug response, all paths seem to lead to HLA, which we, uh, we none of us have been able to figure out, but it does seem Whenever you want to look, if you see a big adverse drug response, the first place you might look, and you wouldn't be wrong a lot of the time, is HLA. Whatever the drug response seems to go to HLA. And we, we don't know the mechanism of that, but um, if you were short on cash, it's the first place to start. Um, drug repositioning. So I think a, a pharmaceutical talk about genetics would not be complete without some mention of drug repositioning. This is, um, some people also call this drug repurposing. Some people call it, um, you could call it dead drugs. Uh, some, it's taking a medicine developed for one indication and finding a new indication for it. Now, this is pretty interesting because the genetics that we have today lend itself to this really, really well. That is, I just tried to argue to you that we've had two orders of magnitude increase in genetics findings over the last not even 10 years. So we have a whole bunch of parts, segments of the genome that predict or should predict to some extent disease, risk to disease, to developing some disease. And on the other hand, we've got a bunch of medicines that are developed for some disease. So what if we just put them together? This is kind of interesting, and it's a bioinformatics exercise, but I think it's an interesting one. So it's a complicated slide, but just let's start for the moment. Just look at the top left and the, just look at the, can I have this? This part and this part. Let's take, this is, a, this is a picture of all the findings on the genome. These are really interesting and they're dynamically uh, updated by the NIH. Take all the genetic association findings, the 2,000 plus of those findings. So what you'll have there is a pair, a gene and a disease pair for each one. And let's go on the other side of this and we'll take all the, the drugs that we have in the pipeline or on the market. So now you have a drug and a, um, and an indication pair. The drug, we know the mechanism, we, we generally, we know what it is targeting, and uh, we have an indication that it's treated for. So the commonality would be we have a disease from a genetics and a disease from the drug. Let's look to see when they match. How often do the genetic association studies that we see have the same gene, the same target of drugs that have been developed? That would sort of be a, a uh, retrospective validation of the genetics, if you will. That if you had found the gene to begin with, you could have gone and made a, a drug for it. 
Those are kind of interesting, and people use those for lots of, um, lots of useful exercises for uh, showing the utility and the relevance of genetics, good for grants and so on. Um, I think it's more interesting to look at the mismatches. So what if you've got a drug for some target built for this indication, but the genetics point to a different one for that same gene? So the drug says the drug is working, it's on the market, say, or it's in development for uh, osteoporosis, but actually the genetics say that same gene is relevant to a completely different indication. That would be a repurposing example. And I think those are um, perhaps the more interesting ones. Here are a few examples uh, that people raise for um, those where they match, so this sort of retrospective proof, if you will, of genetics. Uh, HMG-CoA reductase um, for statins would be a terrific example to start with, where the genetic association points you to uh, LDL, and of course we know uh, where statins work, so that would be a, a positive example. I think the more interesting ones, as I said, are these, where they mismatch. And I raise the, um, the uh, osteoporosis one, or bone density, for a particular reason there. There, there is a, a very uh, effective drug on the market called denosumab uh, by Amgen that for osteoporosis, or bone density, uh, developed, it's marketed, it's, um, it's, uh, it's live today, but the target of denosumab, the strongest genome-wide association um, indication for that is Crohn's disease. It's not, it's not bone density at all. It's not osteoporosis. It's Crohn's. Those types of examples are really, really interesting and potential to, to pivot from one indication to another. Now, drug repurposing or repositioning has been around for a very, very long time, and it has a um, a variable history in rare diseases where things have been, drugs have been passed from uh, company to company, little biotech companies, until they sort of find a home sometimes for rare diseases, but not systematically. And I think the question here that I'm just putting out there to you is, is does the genetics that we have today that is being generated not by industry at all, but by uh, basic research in academia, lend itself to more systematic repositioning um, possibilities. Now, to date, it hasn't taken off that way. And actually, we, we look at this a lot in, um, in GlaxoSmithKline, I'm sure all the major pharma do, uh, and just look to see what other opportunities are out there. But there are lots of reasons um, why things don't work, and there are lots of reasons uh, why, why uh, one wouldn't want to go forward with different drugs. And it's interesting, but I, I flag it because I think this will be an area as more and more data are generated, and we go into things like electronic medical records, um, these type of links could be made and maybe there is a more systematic use and maybe there's a whole um, potential there for better treatments and new indications for existing medicines. Uh, it's an opportunity, but it's not yet systematized, I guess is the point there. So, so that's where we are up to date. Now, what I, what I really wanted to, to talk about today um, the, the, two, the first two topics were background. Um, I want to talk about target validation. And I, I first will give you a little bit of a whinge about target validation. I understand you had to talk about pricing, so this one will probably um, come to haunt me. But the, the situation for, for research and development in, in the pharmaceutical industry is, is really tough. And you can hear this and you can say, I know people have their own perspectives on, um, on pharma versus uh, academia. But, but the reality is the timelines to make medicines, these are just the data, are getting longer for whatever reason. The, let's switch to the right-hand side. The costs are increasing to make a medicine dramatically. And the success rates are not great. They're getting worse and worse. And um, so you can see this is, this is quite an interesting slide. I'll show you another version of the same thing in a moment. From the first time you're into a clinic for a new compound, just looking at safety, then looking at efficacy, then phase three, et cetera, the success rates here are not great, 50, 60 percent, 30 percent. So most things fail along the way. It's an industry built on failure, in fact. And you could argue, oh, yes, they're, they're always whinging about these type of things. But if you look around, this is, this is having significant consequences where we're, there's contraction in the industry. Wherever you look, there's always um, some big reduction in force for some major pharma in research and development. And it will eventually have an impact on the medicines that come through this pipeline. So that's the situation. And it's just the data that, that, that exists. 
and it's actually, it's actually worse than that. So if I can explain something to you, the attrition, so the failure rates in drug discovery, this is, I'll get to a science point in a moment, but it's, it's important to realize the background here. The failure rates are increasing. Right? We're not getting better at this, we're getting worse at this. So the drug discovery programs that get started today, more are failing today than failed a couple of years ago. And these top uh, bits of the slide here show the increase in failure rate. Okay, so it's going up every stage of development. This is when you're in animal models and then we move right through the pipeline. And the problem is, if you look at these things like phase three, the, the worst time to fail in drug discovery is in late stage, because one has invested 12 years of time and a, and a billion dollars or, or multi-billions of, of dollars there. You want to fail? If you're going to fail, fail early. Fail, pick a target and have it not work really early in a mouse model or something. That's the time to fail in drug discovery. You don't want to fail when all the time and the, and the money's been spent. Yet that's where the slope is about steepest in terms of decreasing attrition. So this is, this is a, a, a really difficult spot that the industry is finding itself in, that the time to fail is, is, not, is 12 years after you started the project. And that is the, that the bottom slide here just shows that is ha actually the, the most expensive time to fail as well. So we've got to fix this. And I, I would contend that's partly a science problem, not, a, not just an industry problem. And to get to the point here, if you look at those late stage programs, most of those that fail, or, or half of those that fail, let's say, um, fail due to lack of efficacy, right? Um, and so you, you have half of those things fail because adverse events came up that weren't detected when one looked at small samples, and half of them fail because they didn't work, okay? Now, um, of those failures, how many could be improved of the efficacy failures just by improving the target that one works on 10 years previously. Just slightly picking targets that were going to have an impact on the disease that you knew could have, that if you change and modify a target, actually would have some impact on disease. It would have a huge, huge swing factor on the cost because you don't need to change the whole industry. You just need to move a few of them and then the cost drop and the attrition drops and everything switches. So, so the, the situation here is actually we're, we're finding ourselves where to fix the latest stage problem, we need to look at the earliest part of the pipeline. The choice of what we choose to, the choice of the target to work on um, in a drug discovery campaign. So I, I think this is a really interesting time in, um, in pharma and in, and in science where Really, you could boil down big pharma decisions in research and uh, development into sort of four key decision points. You choose what target you're going to work on, you choose what molecule you're going to um, modify that target with, what dose you're going to choose, and who you're going to put it in. It's, <laughs> everything else uh, actually stems from those main decisions. So actually, choosing that target is the key point. Everything follows from the, the choice of target um, that, we, that we select. And we all know that the translation of those target of basic biology to the clinic is called the valley of death and it hasn't got any better. And we know that the animal models, even though we all rely on them, they're often really suboptimal. They don't work very well. They don't inform the decision. So can we improve the situation? And I would contend that actually the situations, the timing of genetics, this is where it's perfect. We've got all these increases in monogenics. I think I heard recently there's up to three new discoveries per week um, in terms of monogenic diseases because of sequencing and because of the, the potential uh, from the technology that we have in front of us. We've got all this increase of information with cells and tissues and samples. Sequencing is dropping in cost, etc. And the bottom point there is all we really need is small improvements in the selection of targets to have big consequences on the drug discovery paradigm. Now, you might ask, well, aren't we using that information already? And, and you could rightfully criticize um, those in industry, those in biotech, actually in academia, and in pharma for how they choose targets. And the reality is the way targets are chosen is highly, highly variable. Sometimes targets are chosen with a huge body of information, both on animal models and human data and, and historic uh, understanding of a mechanism. And, some, and sometimes drug targets are chosen because someone wrote a paper and thought it was really interesting and was inspired. And you don't really find out if that paper was right or if that inspiration was, was really insightful for a decade um, because you don't really find out the efficacy until that decade comes. So we've got we to improve on that, on the, the information 
that we could use to pick targets. Now, it's quite interesting. This is a complicated slide, but this is kind of the, the key slide for this part of the presentation. Um, on the left are a whole bunch of different types of gene. OMIM is online Mendelian inheritance in man. So those are um, Mendelian single gene disorders. And, uh, and then there are various others. GWAS are more common disorders. And what this slide is showing is an odds ratio, predictability, how well does a target work given that it has genetic information? Knowing that there's a genetic association or a genetic mutation, how much does that increase the chance of that drug succeeding? Right? So basically, how relevant is genetics to drug discovery in a retrospective way? And what this shows is for Mendelian diseases, if you know the mutation in that disease and you go make a medicine to that mutation, you have a tenfold greater chance of not knowing that mutation. So that's, that's kind of not surprising because we know that Mendelian uh, disorders, if we know the, the mutation, the mechanism, it should increase your chance of making a successful drug there. What's surprising here, I think, is that even for common diseases, things like hypertension or, or diabetes, having just genome-wide association data, which we all would argue is robust but not very hel helpful in the sense of um, we often don't know the actual gene, it could be lots of different variants, it, um, we generally don't know the mechanism. There's a lot of dirtiness in that data, but just knowing that doubles your chance of, of being right all the way through for efficacy, doubles the chance. It's the biggest predictor of, of success in drug discovery apart from having drugged that gene already. That is, the best predictor of success for any, dr for any drug is, is already knowing that it works for a different indication or a different drug. The next biggest predictor of success is genetics, even GWAS data. So, so the contention there is all you need is a little bit there, and we've got it right in front of us. All we need to do is figure out how to use this. Um, and, and actually, this is a really complicated one, but the point, the point here is, on the, is in the title um, and not in the data, that for, for drug discovery, it doesn't matter if it has a really big effect size. It doesn't need to be necessarily a monogenic. Even a GWAS effect size of odds ratio of 1.3 may prove that that gene is relevant to that disease. Now, how you drug that gene and dose and selectivity and potency, et cetera, may still make an effective drug, even though it has a small effect size. The point is, we've got the information right in front of us for targets, and we have a problem with late-stage failure. So, so the solution, I think, the most exciting part of genetics today is marrying those two, because the impact of genetics could be really, really profound um, in, uh, in selecting things to work on um, that, will actually, that will actually prove to be uh, effective uh, later on, way down the road. Just to show you empirically, because that's all in silico um, bioinformatics type work, uh, AstraZeneca recently did a review of their own pipeline um, and what worked and what didn't uh, over the past number of years. And, the, and this slide, you can read it yourself, but actually they found that projects with human genetic evidence um, of target with disease had a, had a much greater success rate than those without. So there's empirical data for this, this same uh, point that I'm trying to make to you. So what's, what's next in this area? I think this is, this is really exciting for us because we, can, we have all this genetic information. We have all this GWAS data that, again, gets criticized as positives and negatives um, for GWAS. And the challenge is knowing which one to pick because it is only a two-fold effect size. So if you get it right, you'll double your chances of being, um, making a medicine that's effective. But we've gone from a situation of not having enough things to look at with only 20 known genes for common diseases to having too many and not knowing which ones will give you the best chance of success. So I think I'm completely in alignment with uh, Dr. Weinshelboom on this. The next generation of this is not going to be genetics alone. It's going to be bringing together the other information. Um, this particular paper I point you to I think is a beautiful one for a gene called BCL11A um, that's uh, involved in uh, uh, beta globin um, uh, hemoglobinopathies, and the, I, the, the point of this paper was that there was GWAS data, there was association data pointing to a few different things, wasn't really clear what it was telling us to do. The, the best uh, evidence for association was a long way away from anything that coded for a protein, so we didn't really know what to do with it. But bringing in further information, in this case uh, regulatory information about transcriptional regulation, 
not only pointed exactly to the point of intervention there, but showed cell specificity. Is it, is it expressed? Is it doing things in exactly the right tissue erythroid cells here and not in others? It points directly to a drug discovery paradigm that one could work on that takes the GWAS data, nonspecific in general, but kind of pointing in the right direction, and absolutely narrows it down laser focus. And the more that we can bring these type of omics data together, uh, I think this field of target validation will crack wide open and we'll see um, lower attrition rates. Maybe we'll drop that cost. We should be able to decrease the time um, a bit in the, in the process as well because we're starting with human data uh, and not animal data. So that's, that's the target validation setting that I wanted to describe to you. And I did want to make the point that um, James Black, who's a very famous drug discoverer, Poplanolol, um, had said, um, most, the most fruitful basis of discovery of a new drug is to start with an old drug. And that is this point about the best place to start is one that's where we know the mechanism, we know the gene or, or whatever we're working on because it's already been modified in a way that's effective. The data to date suggests that the next most fru fruitful basis is, is actually naturally occurring genetic variation. It's the best predictor that we've got on a target basis beyond um, having done it already. So finally, where I really wanted to leave this is, um, is just pointing to the future. And we, we don't have great insights. Um, th there are others, there will be others here speaking uh, about electronic medical records where this is a really exciting area. I, th I think you'll see the pharmaceutical industry move in this space quite rapidly. Uh, I don't know that people know exactly which way that's going to lead us, but bringing together the information on one hand of the broad population-based medical information and the biological side that we're seeing with sequencing and with um, the omics data at scale is almost certain to um, have great advantages for the pharmacogenetics applications or pharmacogenomics that we talked about early, potentially for repositioning. Um, who knows where that will take us with uh, new targets? And uh, so it's, it's really interesting to see where that goes. And I, I think all of the efforts that are now being conducted to, to bring together these, these type of data sets and to fund them to, to derive the biological information are absolutely um, really important on a population basis and worth their, their weight in gold. I'll give you just a hint of where we're heading. We, in a, in a real world setting, um, GlaxoSmithKline has a really um, strong historic presence in respiratory um, drugs, Advair, for example, and, and a follow-on um, called Relvar Brio. And one of the things we were interested in, as one often is, is real-world settings. So clinical trials are absolutely essential for asking really strict, rigid, hypothesis-driven questions. But what they don't ask is questions like, um, are people taking their medicines in the real world? They'll take them in a clinical trial if you, if you monitor that trial. But if you want to know, um, are they taking them, are they getting, deriving the benefit in real life, you don't do that in a clinical trial setting. And so we and other companies are going in the same direction, actually are going into that setting of real world observational type data. In this case, I, I put it up because it was quite an interesting one. We wanted to know if people were taking um, um, a COPD and asthma medicine and went to a city in England. Um, I think it's the rainiest city in all of England, actually. I think it has that moniker. Um, and looked at the whole city and managed because they, they monitor uh, prescription through their pharmacies. We're able to, uh, it's ongoing now, but are able to track um, at least uptake um, and uh, disbursement of medicines in a real world way that's not clinical trial relevant at all. I'll give you a final example on the real world setting, not really electronic medical records, but the embracement of observational data and not just clinical trials in a, in a fun example that we did a few years ago now, where um, to, to describe my own bias, um, we were being pushed in, internally in the company to explore, pharma's pretty, pretty conservative in general, and uh, being pushed to explore digital media or social media. Um, and, uh, and I was one that was very resistant to this, but, but we ended up um, working with one of the uh, consumer genetics companies, still in existence today, to, as a pilot study, to see is there relevance of genetic information from what are heading toward electronic medical records. And um, so this is a study that we, we did with them. And um, to make it as benign as possible, we just said, let's just look at male pattern baldness. Okay, so we look in their database. This is, um, this is 23andMe that we did this with a few years ago. We've published it now. Uh, 
And so 23andMe has this, this database where the, the genetic information is reused. So you provide DNA and they genotype you and then you fill out lots of forms online and, and it's just, then it's just a computational exercise, link the variation in DNA with this trait or that trait or another trait. So they put out a, um, a something on their website for baldness and you can see the pictures here and you could judge yourself on baldness. And we ask, can we find anything using that information? Now that's about as, um, no, observational as they come because the DNA could be from anyone and the questionnaire you could fill out flippantly, whatever you like. But um, many reasons why this wouldn't work. And actually it was, it, was really, it was really interesting to us. There were two known genes prior to that time. In about a week's work, um, those genes were replicated online in this and two more were proposed. It took a year to go out and find all the academic studies that we could to, to see if those two new ones were false positives or real, but they turned out to be real and there were even more out there. And the point is, with large sample sizes that these type of databases give us, and as long as the data are unbiased, the noise should cancel. And in fact, in this particular case, it doubled the knowledge of genetics evidence in about a week. It doubled the total cumulative history of genetic information in about a week's work, um, just by bringing together the large, large samples that we'll see in electronic medical records that will be available um, to all of us in a very short period of time. So really excited, we're all very, not so much just about baldness, this was a pilot study, but um, about the potential of those records. So I'll close here and just summarize that where I started was genetics has been through this hype cycle and, I, and I, I'm really excited to still be in the field because now it's super exciting. Again, it's real, the findings are robust, the potential is, um, is tangible and we're starting to see it translate. Um, it's translating in a way that I don't think we predicted necessarily with per personalized medicine. I think we all um, naively or not had hoped that it would just be a bit of genotyping and it would be the, the um, individualized drug. The drug repositioning uh, applications that I described to you have yielded success, but not yet systematically. We'll see where that goes. I think the target validation everyone's coming to now, there are lots of public-private initiatives. The NIH have some. We've initiated a new center in, um, in the UK that's completely open for um, all parties, academic, industry, whatever. Um, and finally, I just wanted to flag the emergent interest and the potential of electronic medical records, electronic health records, and um, that has a h huge opportunity for uh, the next generation of medicines. I'll stop there and thank you. Thanks so much, Lon. I, I love that social media 23andMe <laughs> example. Um, it, I'm just curious, what else do you think you can do along those lines yeah. now? Great potential, it seems. I think those type of things are, are really, really exciting. I want them to get bigger, mm -hmm. right? Because as we start moving into disease, a number may sound large, 60,000 or 100,000, it gets really small <laughs> because you start talking about the genotype, the frequency of the gene you're interested in is less than 50%. The disease might be 5 or 10%, and before you know it, 100,000 becomes 100 or a couple of thousand. And so. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm so, we're all so supportive of the electronic health record initiatives. We need millions in these if we mm -hmm. really want to take it to, to a disease relevant setting. And to your point, uh, the bigger you can go, the more you're able to filter out that noise. Yep. That's, that's the hypothesis here. And there, um, there's a field of epidemiology who's shown this for a while. As long as the biases that one has are not systematic, mm -hmm. so that in this case, you know, for some reason, some subset of males were answering the questionnaire in a particular way. Right. As long as it's just noise, up and down, then the numbers will help. And that's, I think that's what helped in the uh, 23andMe example. And I would hope that's going to be the case. There's a large body of work needs to be done, but I would hope that's the case in electronic health records. Well, um Lots of great questions coming in here, so I'm going to try to tick through as many of these as possible. Um, there was one that I think picked up a little bit on your points having to do with sometimes you can find success taking a molecule that didn't work somewhere and trying it someplace else. And this person asks, talk more about the prospects of genetics helping address late stage failure. What's the, the role of genetics yeah. potentially in that? It's a, it's a really, really good question. And I have to say my own thinking has evolved quite a lot, uh, even over the last five or six years on that. Um, it's really hard. 
for, especially for drug response, but also for repositioning. The medicines are developed for a specific indication with something specific in mind. Mm -hmm. And so all the studies that were done for that, all the data that we have, were not designed for the genetics question. So um, I, I used to think that the, the best data for these type of questions, in fact, it's why I went to Big Pharma. I thought it would all be in Big Pharma because um, they do have these very large clinical trials, compendiums of them. Companies like GlaxoSmithKline have collected DNA for a very long time with, with informed consent. And, um, but I'm wondering now, is, is it that the data for those later stage questions may actually be in the electronic health records or medical records, at least once they've got to market, because the numbers, because you can get back to the broader numbers. And just curious, because I also, I, I liked the, um, the Salford lung study. What'd you learn? Yeah, it's still ongoing. Okay. It's, uh, but it's really exciting to us, because that's what we want to know. And in this mm -hmm. case, it's once a day versus twice a day. Does that help? And I think, uh, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great open question. It's the right way to do it. It's very clever. And are you incorporating any, um, I'll refer to them as nudges in that study, reminders to people or extra? We're, we're trying to do it as, as real world as possible, okay. right? Now, um, now they know they're in a, they know they're part of a, a large uh, study, so there's that. But uh, we really are, and I think this is the this is I put it up because I think it's a directional trend. Mm -hmm. um, the pharmaceutical industry and the regulators have been very very focused on clinical trials. That's the that's the world we live in, and they, they are appropriate and answer specific questions. But there are other questions, and they're on the other end of the spectrum. And I think we're, we're, we're finding both sides of those coming together. And, so and I think some of those questions on the other end of the spectrum, we were uh, talking about yesterday uh -huh. in a couple of our sessions, particularly around cost, as yeah. I mentioned to you earlier. And, and I, I appreciated that you put up some of the information around the R&D challenges today, yeah. the length of time, et cetera. But can you talk a little bit about the newer pressures on pharmaceutical companies to not only prove now safety and efficacy, but yeah. probably value to those purchasers. Yeah, it's, there's, there's, no, there's no doubt that the pressures are uh, increasing and they're changing and they're, and they're not always consistent um, across geographic parts of the world. So th there are new pressures on, on, um, on the pharmaceutical industry. I think what people don't realize, because you focus on the pricing, and it is an important one, but the pharmaceutical industry also wants to make better medicines. And the best thing we could do is make um, drugs that have massively good uh, improvements over the existing ones. It's the best thing we could do. So, so the, the value in terms of safety and efficacy, we want to do that too. And that's exactly where we, we are on that. So the pricing pressures, um, I mean, things are changing. The, the world is changing and we have to adapt to it. And the reason uh, I put the information up that I did is because there's this very um, complex world of pricing and um, the, the marketing and, and uh, off-label use and all that, and that trickles down directly to the R&D process, and people need to know that, that that is impacting the uh, potential that we have for making those next generation of medicines. Okay, I think you anticipated a little bit of what I was gonna follow up here, and obviously not an easy question, but as you look at the R&D process today, um, where might there be some potential for either moving more rapidly or reducing the costs. Yeah. Um, everyone wants to know that, right? right. I wish, I wish yeah, I had we'd, we'd be king and queen so, of the world if we had that answer. So, so our view, one uh, point which maybe I didn't make is clear, I think if we can reduce attrition, it has a big effect. Attrition. Because, because the reason we, we put those big numbers on the cost to get a drug to market is that individual drug didn't cost a billion dollars. Right. We had all those failures. The failures. Pay for. So that's part of it. But I think there are practical ways, too, um, that we could improve on this. There's, a, there's an initiative called Transcelerate, which is bringing the different, yeah. um, a number of the different pharmaceutical companies together. Which is Based practical. in Europe, is that correct? Um, Transcelerate? it's international, I think. Okay. And um, one of the things they're, they have discussed, I don't know how far this will go, is, is just um, the practical operation of clinical trials. So if you go, you probably do many, many, I know you do many here at, at, uh, at Mayo, 
if you go into many major centers, you'll see multiple clinical trials ongoing in the same place. With, you know, there's the GSK computer and the Novartis computer and the mm -hmm. Pfizer computer. If, if we could somehow standardize things, there's not a competitive advantage to having three different computers. If we could standardize these and share some costs operationally, that will knock things off because the trials are a big piece of it. Yeah, I have to say for audience members, if you're not familiar with Transcelerate, I think it's a very exciting effort that, that's going on right now. And to see so many of those industry players yes. coming together around some of the less competitive or non-competitive yes. areas um, is, is pretty exciting. It makes sense. So, it really makes yeah. sense. So for all of you tweeting, you want to check out Transcelerate and tweet away about, about them and Lon. Um, a couple more from our audience. Do you think the decline in good drug targets may be due to consumption of good targets from a finite pool? It's it is a question, right? We have the druggable genome that has been, which is only a, a fraction of what's out there. Um, it, it, is, it is possible that we have a finite pool. I, would, I wouldn't be here speaking in this regard if I didn't think that's not the case. I think, I think there's a lot left unexplored. Okay. I think we don't know the mechanisms. And I think what I didn't talk about today, but there's a lot of new drug delivery modalities on the horizon that are gene therapies coming back for example, mm. uh, antisense therapies that may get to those parts of the genome we could never even look at before. So the targets that we couldn't even think about exploring, we may now be able to explore further. Just because we've advanced in terms of our capabilities and our understanding. And then, then maybe some of those are not amenable to small molecule chemistry. We've got to find a different way to get those in. Mm. And, and the technologies that we see in front of us today are, are beginning to show some promise that way. And that's, that's really exciting because mm. It opens up lots of things that may be mechanistically very interesting. We just couldn't make medicines to them. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that's touching on, I think, several of the points we've been covering here. Assuming the increasing rate of discovery due to lower cost of sequencing means more opportunity to fail. You talked a lot about an industry built on failure. The question is, how do we improve the picks? Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's where I want us all to work, actually. Um, all, all of us, and that's not an industry question. So we have all this big pool now to choose from. And, we need, and you're absolutely right, we need to pick from that pool. It's, it's, a, it's the paradox. We've gone from having too few to too many now. <laughs> um, it is our contention, uh, mine personally, but also uh, some of us in industry, GlaxoSmithKline is one, that the targets themselves, the genes, the annotation, the understanding of the biology, that's not intellectual property. That is open for all of us. The, the pharmaceutical industry can compete on what pharma does best, which is making medicines. The biology behind that, we should all get together on and understand those targets so that we can pick better. Um, and we do that, we do that jointly. That's, that's why all of these things should be in a public-private uh, domain. And are there currently, I, I apologize, I don't know this, are there initiatives along those lines already? There, there, are, there have been attempts to bring them together um, for quite some time. I can give you um, two examples where they, they have recently come together. One is called the um, uh, Accelerated Medicines Partnership from the NIH that they have led that brings together a series of, um, of pharmaceutical companies and, uh, and the NIH around a few Alzheimer's disease, type 2 diabetes, right. um, rheumatoid arthritis. And another one is one that we've, I alluded to in my presentation that we've put um, with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and the European Bioinformatics Institute called the Center for Therapeutic Target Validation, which is really just trying to bring together all people with like-minded views from f basic biology function to drug discovery to informatics and data integration in one place to try and bridge that valley of death. And it's completely open. All the information is open. You know, that makes me think, we've certainly been hearing more from FDA and I think some of the industry players as well, that there is more of a focus now on dialogue earlier in the yeah. approval process. And my impression is that folks find that valuable. Would, yeah. would you agree and yeah. can there be even more? There, there could always be more, more dialogue with, with the regulars. You've got Larry Lesko coming up here, and he can, he can um, speak We're stacking to up the questions Yeah, I know, but, Larry, but he's good, he's... so he can fill okay. them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the more dialogue that we have, it, um, the better. And it does seem like both sides are listening, right? and that's a, that's a real positive development. It's not, a, it's not that we're hearing that the regulators, at least the FDA, are taking a, a fierce, staunch position that w we see as, as out of sync with the direction that we're taking. Okay, final um, question, crystal ball, where might we see some of the next uh, breakthroughs? 
Um, you know, I, I, I avoided today, and I should have said this at the beginning, discussions of oncology, because personalized medicine for somatic genetics is alive and well, mm -hmm. and, and it is absolutely part of the fabric of drug discovery. So the question that I would ask on this, is there going to be another oncology behind it? And that's what okay. we all hope. And I would, I, I would hope, if I were really looking, maybe in the um, immunology domain. Okay, wonderful. Everyone, let's thank Lon. Thank you.